Hi, everyone. You're listening to the Engineering Politics Podcast. Today is the second and final part of another long conversation I had with Truman from Return to Reason. We continue our discussion on the shifting hierarchy at large in America, and therefore around the world today. Because this conversation was so long, almost four hours to be exact, we decided to split it up into two different podcasts. This will be Engineering Politics Podcast number 20 and 21. But if you want a good foundation for this discussion, since this is a topic we've expanded on in several podcasts already, listen to the Engineering Politics Podcasts number 17, 18, and 19 to get caught up on our last conversation. And because it's a long podcast, there will be no bonus content at the end. But I would still appreciate you joining and subscribing to the Engineering Politics Locals community. You can go to engineeringpolitics.locals.com and become a member for free, or get the subscriber pass for as little as $2 per month. And you can use promo code EPFREE for a three-month free trial of the subscription pass. That's spelled E-P-F-R-E-E. I'll go over more of where you can find me and support this content after the show. Also, make sure to show some support for Truman from Return to Reason. You can find Truman and his Locals community at returntoreason.locals.com. If you like the Engineering Politics Locals community, you'll love the Return to Reason Locals community too. So go check them out. All right, let's get this started. This is the Engineering Politics Podcast. So yeah, so let's get into history as a like as a means of feedback that if it's restricted is another red flag. Yeah. And and the reason again I put this in in the cut off communication category is uh, it's important to learn lessons from the past to understand how we ought to interact with uh, the present and move into the future. So um, uh, I would say revisionist history is one of the more uh, sinister ways of um, rejecting feedback into the system. So the, the specific example I'm talking about is the infamous 1619 project um, by the New York Times Magazine. There's a really good video I've been watching and actually haven't been able to finish it yet, but it's uh, through Reason TV and it's an interview with Philip W. Magnus, who's a economics historian and a research fellow at the American Institute of Economic Research. And he's one of the first public scholars to come out and criticize the 1619 project. So um, he, he, again, comes at a more economic perspective the 1619 Project is really a collection of essays that kind of go through, again, what I consider a revisionist history of America and its relationship with slavery. 1619 uh, implies that that was the real beginning of America, not 1776, because the slaves were brought over at that time. And that's kind of what um, was the, the kind of original point that, that really started the American experiment we see today. So already there, they're trying to kind of sinisterly uh, change the origins of America to reflect uh, their perceived uh, uh, view of the way they see America today. And that, that's honestly one of the worst ways to, to um, see history is by, uh, and we see it time and time again, uh, you know, Ibram Kendi talks about it. Uh, I think one of the worst um, people who, who, who does this is um, who's the the writer, uh, not Ibram Kendi, but Ta-Nehisi Coates. So he, he'll he'll take an example of something that happened a long time ago and then jump it to today and assume the dynamics are are the exact same and try to relate those intentions to something happened today and say the intentions are the exact same because the the um, if the outcomes of the situations were somewhat similar. Right. So that, that's a, a way to to use revisionist history or even real facts that happen in history and try to translate the, that context to today and dishonestly represent what's happening today. Um, and this this interview uh, with Philip Magnus, he, he, he wrote a book eventually on, on his um, critiques on it. And I have, it just came in now in the mail here. So I haven't read this yet, but I, I've listened to enough of the interview where I think I'm getting a gist of it and uh, I look forward to reading it. But um, he, for one, says there, there actually are a mixed bag of good and bad stuff in the 1619 Project as a whole. And normally when I'm looking for resources, especially who critique something, uh, a big thing I want to see is them to agree in some respects with whatever they're critiquing. That Give the devil his due in some exactly. way. Exactly. And I think it's important. That's what I try to do when I review books like How to Be an Anti-Racist. I try to seed some ground and be like, okay. 
here's something we agree on. This thing isn't a total dumpster fire. And, you know, we can at least move forward with uh, critiquing some of the, the different ways we believe or the different ways we see the world. So, you know, he, he, he makes a point. There's some good scholarly articles, but there's also a mixture of clear advocacy for political agendas. Uh, for example, one of them, I forgot what, who the essay was by, but it was an essay effectively saying the origins of capitalism is in slavery, which is insanely stupid. I mean, that's just yep. on its face. It's just, just something that's uh, just a really dumb um, correlation there. Uh, and and what he did at the beginning is he wrote letters to the editors at the New York Times Magazine and said, hey, there's a bunch of inconsistencies in here. You know, I think it would be a better well-rounded article if you change these so you don't, you know, lose a big audience by showing that, okay, maybe we didn't do all the research we should. And there was also examples of people who, who consulted on the project who said, okay, we shouldn't do this. And they just completely ignored they them. They ignored them. Put it, yep. there, put it in there anyways. So his feedback from the editors immediately were like, no, we're not going to change anything. Uh, basically, we want to protect the narrative we're trying to portray. So, because this guy's an economic historian, he he uh, automatically goes to the the uh, bad relationships they're trying to imply with economics to slavery. That uh, it's like you know you're mis mis completely misrepresenting uh, what's happening. Yet you know, absolutely no uh, pushback or uh, total pushback, and, and no willingness to change. And uh, he even mentions in, in the interview. Um, it almost seemed like people like Nicole Hannah Jones not only rejected uh, one of the sides of the argument, but like when, cause I, I think he talked to her personally and it seemed like she didn't even know that this argument was there. She didn't even know that the opposing view was there in the first place. So it's not, not only dishonesty, but it's like, it's ignorance. Either, either you, yeah, you put blinders on and you refuse <laughs> to believe yep. some of these things that, that have come out in the past. And, and especially with like the history of capitalism where um, Magnus goes into, uh, you know, some other books. Um, I forgot the name of the book. It was uh, something on the cross, but it was Time on the Cross uh, was a book that uh, said, because the, the, the main free market economics argument against slavery uh, was it is not a viable system. Um, if you, the part of economics isn't just, it's not all profit, which is what the, the, the opposition against uh, free markets always says it is. It is uh, the ability to innovate and make things a bit easier for the people producing these things. Right. Yeah. Uh, we can't say that our quality of life is worse than it was in the 1700s because n almost none of us do real hard manual labor where we at least don't have tools at our disposal to make it significantly easier than it used to be. Right. We, we drive toward innovation and that helps us, you know, balance purchasing power and different things like that. So these two uh, economists, Robert Fogel and Stanley Engerman, uh, made the argument that there was actually some plantations that uh, showed some economic viability and actually were able to turn a profit even though they were using the slavery model. Uh, this was used to to say uh, against those two authors to say, oh, you guys are trying to economically uh, validate slavery, in which their reply was no, we're just pointing out uh, that there were some successful plantations doing it. And the reason they were doing it is their their incentives were different when it came to the slaves. Uh, their slaves were able to, uh, if they worked harder, they improved their living conditions, they improved uh, their work conditions, you know, they kind of promoted from within and, and uh, were able to uh, improve their work conditions if they, they innovated and worked hard enough and, and stuff like that. Now, I'm not arguing and neither were they arguing that this is still a moral system. It's completely immoral. It's slavery. It's awful. But they were using some of the free market aspects to help improve innovation uh, from within inside. And the only reason I find this important, again, not to advocate for what they're doing, but the complete pushback against capitalism as a theory is pushing uh, pushing back against, uh, you know, the, the actual outcomes of capitalism, which is to, yep. again, raise all ships. It's to make sure everyone's improving, because if you don't allow people to play the game, they're going to exit the game, and which we've seen today. But I think we see it. Or create new games that are extractive um, and corrupt. Right. So, and it's something Magnus brings up is, is a lot of these types of um, revisionist history attempts, they always attack capitalism because yeah. if you, if you attack the system that really allows for prosperity and, and 
gives the idea that freedom is a good idea because we we naturally think living in the world and born in the world we're, we're in today that freedom is the default position of the human condition, which it's not. You look back in human history and freedom is kind of a foreign idea. It's like Absolutely. you didn't understand like the idea that you had your own autonomy. You always thought you were serving someone else unless you're on top and you always thought people were serving you, right? So they understand that a free market system allows people to to benefit from their own labor and through that, they understand that freedom is a good thing and they push back against uh, the governors or the people governing them or the people on top. So they, they need to quash that. I mean, that's like the first thing. And that's why you see all these movements, they try to quash capitalism. It's no more free markets because they claim, you know, it leaves too many people on bottom. Well, if people want to exit the game, which is what we see today, and I think part of that is the China thing and, and uh, some of the... the the things, the aspects of the economy that the right fell uh, way short of. And again, it's, I think it goes more to the Ayn Randian belief of economics that builds its own moral system, and that moral system gives people meaning. Well, not exactly. You have to have some sort of moral foundation or to build a, a meaning like that. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's always a common theme you see with these, and a, a common theme, I would say, of a corrupt hierarchy is to attack the thing that's bringing prosperity to the people. Yep. And once you can quench that, now their reliance for prosperity is relied on you and what you can do for them as opposed to what they can do for themselves. And yeah, that's so part, much again, you, you're not allowed to put in feedback into the system if you aren't allowed to put anything into the system yourself. You're not you're oh, allowed to use your own labor to put anything into the system. Yeah, I mean, so much of it goes back to, to Marxism, unfortunately. You know, he's he really is... Uh, kind of the the boogeyman in the closet on a lot of this stuff. Um, and so, I mean, that's, he was very open about how getting rid of religion and getting rid of God was a necessity for revolution, you know, because you can't make government God if people th already have one. Um, well, if there's, an, and, if there's an outlet that gives you meaning other than government, your government's not going to precisely not have the intended consequences. And, and really, the 1619 stuff is, it's none of that's new. I mean, that's Howard Zinn, uh, People's History of the United States, and, you know, kind of the Zinnification of so many of our historical narratives is that kind of rebranding it as these oppressor-oppressed um, narratives. And that's not to say that, that that's not accurate in some situations, but the way those, uh, the people in the various parts are either all nuances removed or they're recategorized or, you know, the system or that situation is treated like it's some kind of isolated thing. You know, so American slavery, for example, um, is treated like some kind of isolated thing. Uh, you know, so none of that's new. And I, and I think that it's, I'm glad that you brought that up of history, revisionist history and, um, you know, changing or, or, you know, skewing history as another way of prohibiting feedback into the system. Um, I think that's actually a really good point because like you said, we, we learn different things from history. You know, history doesn't, uh, repeat itself, but it does often rhyme. And the reason why we get such, you know, the generation, I think it's Gen Z is way more, uh, warm to socialism than it is to capitalism because it has no freaking understanding of what socialism is and it's no it's no mistake that the same people in charge of the 1619 project are attacking capitalism and are uh you know warm towards um socialism just like howard zinn was i mean howard zinn was involved in communist uh rallies he was in he was um associated with communists all throughout his early life and and his formative and, years and real quick i got two packages in with two different books the other one that came in <laughs> oh, wow. Exactly. Enjoy. Um, okay. Yeah, but it, but the point is, that I think Zinn wrote that in the in the 70s, I believe. Um, the first copy, uh, or the first version of it was in the 70s, maybe the 80s, but I think it was 70s. Um, and so none of this is new, and it all goes back to the same, the same ideas. The question is, how much legitimacy is it given? You know, Zinn was given more and more legitimacy over the years. Um, and it, how long did it take for, uh, the 1619 project, you know, uh, Nicole Hannah, uh, no, Nicole Hannah Jones, Nicole Hannah Jones, oh, yep. Jones. Jones. Okay. Um, so yeah, yeah. She got the Pulitzer, right? So, um, 
Is that the peel? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She got a Pulitzer for her work on. Yeah. Uh, I have, yeah. So she got it for a commentary and something yeah. else. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, that's instant legitim- legitimizing. Um, whereas Zen, it took him a while to kind of achieve that. Um, and so, you know, the question isn't the existence of these ideas or are they really new? Um, not really. The question is how much legitimacy are they given? And again, as the really the left has kind of been the, the bastion for, or the, or not the bastion, but the, the safe uh, place for this to kind of germinate a little bit and to grow and metastasize. Um, it's given more and more legitimacy uh, as it's infiltrated and spread and populated and completely consumed the dominant, you know, cultural structure of, you know, power and authority on the left. So the Howard Zins, the, the, I mean, Zins dead now, but Coates um, um, and 1619 Project folks, all of that, um, they have gained ascendancy. They're, they're get, they're, they don't really have to fight to earn the legitimacy with these ideas. In fact, they're presumed to be the default position. And to your point about history again, um, I, I believe it's, this is more of a social media thing, but it, it is relevant. Man, this might be high. It could be someone else. It talks about like, if you were to say that, um, let's say we have a, 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 a pipeline of information um, that we're taking in on a daily basis. And some of that information uh, can, like where that information is grounded, where it's rooted, where it comes from, can be a variety of places. Uh, it could be, it could come from our history. It could come from the now, or it could come from, you know, things that are kind of looking forward or thinking about the future. And uh, I think this is height talks about how with social media and our, and our cell phones and having in our pocket, everything, like if you were to say, which, you know, the pipelines of information, how much of it is rooted in the present and just the now, 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 and how much of it is rooted in actually trying to think and be contemplative about our past. Very little of it is about the past. And so all of our inputs have to do with right now, what's trending, what's going on, you know, it's just this constant, you know, click, 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 click here and just existing in the right now, this instant gratification and very little of our inputs in terms of what informs our lens of reality and informs our thinking about things is rooted in any type of historical understanding of events, of human nature, of truth, really. And because of that, it creates a lot of ends for really bad information about the past to come in. And that's where you get to that revisionist history you're talking about, is that if if all of our information is about the now and no one really has any real framework for what, you know, just basics of our history, then people are totally ripe to be given really bad information about it um, and to, you know, you can say, yeah, socialism is better than capitalism or our, our country is founded in slavery rather than, you know, a total band of misfits, you know, over a couple hundred years who all basically agreed on, uh, I don't want to be told what to do by anyone. And, and that's, you know, just a bunch of adventurers and pioneers and there's uh, bad actors and good actors, but it's definitely not as simple as a bunch of heroes or a bunch of villains. Um, but you're going to be open to, you know, it, think about just your, the milieu. I, I was listening to an interview uh, that Eric Weinstein uh, did with um, some guys. I, I never heard the podcast. It was interesting. But the guy who was interviewing him said that he didn't, he, he was talking about North Korea. And he said, you know, if you grow up in North Korea, you know, think about what you're told. Of course, you're going to just go along with that because that's, all of your information is restricted. You're only given this one narrative. You know, what, what, what competing information source is there? You know, anything that, and, and it's, and the well has been poisoned ahead of time for if they do get information from America, if somehow any information outside information gets in, they've already been primed to not trust it. That it's, it's, this is the evil, you know, Western, whatever thing. 
And if you, you know, take that same principle and apply it to people today, maybe Gen Z and even to millennials and probably, probably to Gen Xers actually in a lot of ways, um, if you think about what is their inputs or what have they been kind of told as their prevailing narratives about, you know, life, about truth, about their country, about the way they get ahead, uh, about their institutions, who to trust, who not to trust, of course they're going to buy into you know the Nicole Hannah Joneses and the uh, the Howard Zinn type narratives because they're not really given much competing uh, information and what what it, co- competing information they are given has already the well's been poisoned they it's well that's just white supremacy or that's just colonial this thing and and so there's no real room for it so. I think that's a good observation that whenever the hierarchy closes itself off to inputs, it doesn't have to just be contemporary inputs. It can also be historical inputs that would say you're going down, like, you know, the the past judges us in a lot of ways because it serves as a thing we can look back on and say, you know, think about like if someone's an addict and they, they know every time I do this or I go to this place, this thing happens. So if the person is looking at their options and they could say, I could go to this place and I could, or I could do this drug or whatever, I know like my past is judging me and saying, you know, what's going to happen if you go down this road. So, you know, you can't claim ignorance here. Well, the past does that with us where we know what happens when we go down certain roads and it judges us and it provides an input to hopefully, you know, hopefully we can learn from you know the mistakes and the successes and the wisdom of the people that came before us Um, but whenever the hierarchy starts to close it off and starts to revise that history or starts to pervert it corrupt it taint it whatever then it's it's not just closing itself off from contemporary feedback it's closing itself off from the wisdom of history um, that serves as a judge of this is what happens when you go down a collectivist road this is what happens when you make identity supreme this is what happens when you quash individual liberty you know that's that old franklin quote those that would give up a little or fundamental or essential liberty for a little bit of temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety um and so like that serves as a judge uh, but if you close it off or if you pervert it or you say or poison the well and say well those are just a bunch of white supremacist slaveholders and so we can't listen to them we can't trust them um that's another way of sealing yourself off from that feedback. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, we, we see this replete with, I mean, it's a typical strategy. I, I shouldn't say this is just something of the extreme left or, or extreme right. I mean, it's something that we see uh, every day in your, your general uh, politics. I mean, you, you see it, even there's infighting inside the, the right with the now incoming um libertarians that uh, really have always kind of been in the middle but are getting forced to the right just because of the uh, insane um, trend leftward that the left is doing right now. But even something as sim- simple as the, the term separation of church and state, which has now been refined to mean so many different things it was never meant to mean, right? We, we don't want to establish a federal – I mean, the original one, although I, I forgot which amendment was um, created to – uh, enshrine it at the the um, state level, but originally it was just meant no federal establishment of religion. The state could technically establish religion if they wanted to, and then an amendment came in to to have the states kind of follow the federal model. But um, the idea was not to to force people to to be part of a religion, and really, separation of church and state is an influence that travels in two directions. Uh, we only see it as the church is not allowed to influence government, while also it was meant to be, uh, uh, I believe. Um, and it was Jefferson called it a wall between uh, politics and religion that re- that politics is not supposed to influence religion as well, which is why you you have um, you know churches that are tax exempt because it's not separation of church and state is really the basis for that idea. And you have a whole bunch of people like, why why is church tax exempt? Separation of church and state? I'm like, well, it's because of the term you just said is the reason <laughs> they're tax exempt. Like you yep. need to understand the origins of the saying. And this wasn't meant to, and I always get a bunch of pushback, especially from libertarians, to try to get away from religion uh, and say, you know, keep your religion out of my my policy. And it's like, well, 
technically it's supposed to strongly influence our policy. You know, as James Adams, who said our, our constitution is made for a moral and religious people. Like they expected religion to be an important part of our lives. We just didn't need to enshrine it in policy. We don't want to force people to be a certain religion, but also we need to be a moral and religious people in order to, to maintain moral policy. And this is something that Dennis Prager alluded to. One of my favorite quotes from him is that you don't have to be a religious person to to be a, a moral person. You don't have to be religious or believe in God to be a moral person, but you do have to be religious and believe in God to build a moral society. Like there, there are certain fundamental values you need to maintain in order to maintain, uh, you know, a moral policy. And, and you can even see this pushing against kind of a, a free market idea is is seen as immoral to many because now you're forcing me to to believe in things or, or do things that I don't want to do. I'm no longer a, my own autonomous person. I don't have individual liberty, which is granted to me by God with the, the spark of divinity that, that naturally comes with my personhood. Yeah, I, yes, that's a, I'll go down the, the church and state one for just for a second here. Um, I thought it was the first amendment. I, I went to look it up. Yeah. The first yeah. amendment is the freedom of religion because they, cause there's actually, I think like seven clauses in the first amendment, but it's so the, there is the an additional no- amendment that does, that does something else though. So oh, yeah, okay. separation of church and state is in there, but I think it's like, I don't know, like 13, 14, I don't know. I, I always get my, definitely amendments. not the 13th. Yeah. Netflix. It's not the 13th. Yes. Um, <laughs> Anyway, but the point was, is that there was a church of England. And so right. they, their, their point was the government can't impose religion on the people. Um, that's really what it was about. It wasn't that the religious institutions can't have any influence on um, the government. And as you mentioned, they actually assumed as, as much, but the, but back to the, the feedback thing, the, the point is, is that there are lots of ways in which you can seal yourself off from feedback into the hierarchy. And I, I think that's an excellent observation that corrupting history, revising history, or just completely removing it altogether. You know, there was an article in CNN, I believe maybe from two weeks ago, where there is a group in Illinois that was trying to argue to remove all history books from their public schools until they can be uh, rewritten in a way that's more inclusive or, you know, something along those lines. And to, in all fairness, it turns out that there, th- that group had been advocating for that for a while, uh, but they're actually they're gaining steam. Um, and so, and the same thing is happening with mathematics. Uh, again, I would I would refer people back to Lindsay's video about two plus two equals four, and look at I believe it's the Seattle public school system that it has this uh, whole new uh, racial uh, equity lens. You know that they're trying to put into math and the framework is crazy where it's like, you know, how, who gets to decide what's right in the classroom? Um, what does it mean to use math for activism and what ways is math used to oppress people? Like activism is an actual, um, so what they put in, in these frameworks is it's, it's students will be able to. And so that's what they, how they decide, like, what are the goals we're, we're moving towards and for the students will be able to, one of them is uh, identify ways in which they can use activism or that they can move math away from individualistic to collectivist thinking. Like it's all throughout there is moving things from individualist to collectivist thinking. And so again, Marx is always the boogeyman in the closet for a lot of these things. Um, But yeah, so we've kind of gotten a little bit into the education system and into our news media and just in terms of how this hierarchy, this corrupted hierarchy is infecting or this corrupted ideology is infecting and corrupting our various institutions from education to um, the the news media and maybe entertainment. And, and like you said, and we, we both agree on those red flags are changing the rules and per- preventing feedback into it. Um, so what, what would you say are some specific, we might've hit on this a little bit, but uh, if we were going to say, you know, let's leave ourselves open to, you know, flushing out some things so it's we can flush out the ways in which this is a problem and how it's perverted the education system, the ways in which this is a problem and how it's uh, perverted and taken over the entertainment, you know, slash news media. And the news media is an entertainment complex now. Um, it is or the ways in which it's a problem that it's taken over corporations or the way that it's infiltrating corporations where they have to pay lip service to this. They have to bend the knee 
to this ideology. Um, so what are some of the ways in which you see, uh, so there's that aspect, but whenever you, we say they're trying to change the rules, um, if you were to put a fine point on some ways in which they're trying to change the rules, uh, that they're trying to make it so that once they gain ascendancy, that no one can supplant them from that ascendancy, um, how would you articulate the way that you see that happening in practical? So if we're trying to keep this in the realm of the practical, um, we kind of, we laid some groundwork. There's a little bit more, you know, philosophical existential, but if we're trying to, you know, be in the practical here, what do you see taking place? Um, so what I would say a mechanism of that cut off a of feedback or cut off communication is cancel culture, right? we, we flesh this out. This is the most obvious one, but to kind of build a more tangible argument, we see this in HR. I mean, cancel culture has increased liability, which is now moved into HR. And now you have a conflation with HR, human resources, and PR, public relations. And this sure. is why you have these massive companies going full social justice because the HR people in there who, who are teaching the individuals inside of that company now understand the liability that comes with some of the things they teach. And they're going to be teaching and making um, uh, advocating for policy or, or implementing policy that's going to trend toward um, going against liability, which is now this cancel culture. They understand the power uh, that is inherent in, in the culture now. And I have brought up before that, you know, I, I've seen some people on the right say, well, the right's done cancel culture before when it comes to, uh, I think I brought up the last podcast where the Dixie chicks uh, were against the Iraq war. And then, you know, a bunch of guys were using their CDs as target practice. So I'm like, okay, that is, that is people not really trying to cancel them. They're just disagreeing with them and saying, okay, I'm not going to buy your product. And, you know, I would say a lot of the, the anti-Trump right use that as an argument. It's like, well, cancel culture is not a real thing because, you know, it's just the free market system that we all love so much uh, reacting to something. Well, no, there, there's a big difference between that and being called a, a, a vile Nazi because you wear a red Make America Great Again hat. Like there's a massive difference between the two. And wear that into your, your place of business and watch HR come down on you pretty hard, but you could probably wear a I'm with her hat and no one's going to bat an eye, right? Yep. So now HR has taken this as, as a liability thing and they also have to move into PR, public relations, to, to project their progressivism to the culture because they understand the culture is what's going to come down hard on them if they don't do it sufficiently. So, you know, it's the... the um, uh, the Trader Joe's attempt to to get rid of uh, the Trader o Jose's, you know, line of Mexican foods uh, that they were originally going to go back on. And now, thankfully, they're they're actually one of the people which is I don't think Trader Joe's is these uh, extremely religious right wing group. It's more Seriously. of a, a place for for hippies and and all the very, very progressives place. But they were actually they had the cojones to uh, push back and, and say, you know, what, this isn't racist. This is just a branding thing. And people like it. No one actually cares, except for the very small fraction of people in this culture who cry about everything. And now I haven't heard uh, any pushback on Trader Joe's. I'm sure some people were uh, saying we're going to uh, boycott them and they probably went nowhere because all the, the rich liberals who, who normally shop there still want to to try to buy these name brand things that I think come with the name Trader Joe's. But the main point is here is the, the influences on cancel culture and institutions like that that find their way to put their foot in the door through HR that can now get ingrained inside of that that large business that moves their way to PR that now forces uh you know, Amazon to bend the knee to Black Lives Matter, right? So this is the the effect of someone that, or a, a place that they consider themselves having no power, right? That's why Black Lives Matter is here because they have no institutional power wielding the ins enough institutional power to have someone like Amazon, probably the biggest company like in the world, to bend the knee to them. So who who really doesn't have the institutional power here? Well, it's obviously not BLM. They they have the power to do the things they yeah. claim that they cannot do. So I think that's yeah. more of a tangible way to, to relate the, this kind of red flag that we should see. 
Well, yeah, and it's the way we see this in action. When you're talking about the PR and the and the, and HR coming in and how they infiltrate the HR. What so what I wrote was I was thinking about. Okay, so first off, you know, we talked about this, but they they prey on the kind of the good intentions and the the goodwill of people by using language that we all kind of agree with and have in common. So equality, justice, um, oppression, uh, those racism, those kinds of things. And so they use that, but they've redefined it, but they've people. So whether it's in these companies or in the um, education system or news media places or whatever, they, people buy in based on that. I think they buy in based on their goodwill and the fact that the language is being manipulated, but they don't really know what they're agreeing to. Uh, right. That's what Hayek writes about. The, the way you do it is you get people that you say, no, you've always held these values. Now let me tell you what they really mean. Um, but once people bought into something that's a moral, like it's, it's for me to say, let's say you and I are going on a road trip and we're leaving from one location and you say, I want to go this way, this way. And I want to go this. And I say, I want to go this way. And at first you agree with me, say, actually, I think that's a better route. Um, but then along the way, you realize, actually, no, it's be way faster if we took your route. Maybe we should deviate to that. There's no moral component to saying, hey, actually, this way is faster. Um, so you can, you can say, hey, I, I agreed with you initially, but here's, I was wrong. You were wrong. We were wrong. This is actually the right way to go. There's no, there's no moral component there. Um, but it's a different animal entirely if I say, aren't you for equality? And you say, yes, I'm for equality. And then we start to do what I want us to do. And then you realize that the route or the definition or what I'm talking about is different than what you understand it to mean. It's a, it's a very different thing. It's not saying, hey, actually, the fastest way is this way. There is now a moral component because you've bought into a premise and now you have to reject the premise of equality while articulating, you know, why you're not actually rejecting a, a moral thing. Um, and so it's a, it's a much, it's a murkier, it's a, it's a way difficult uh, thing to do once people have bought into that premise. And so the people who are, you know, this, you know, again, this is a Hydra thing, but they change the language, they get the buy-in, they infiltrate. And then they now once the, the higher ups, the people have, bought into that press and say, yes, we agree. Then they start to create policy, whether it's in these companies or in the government, um, create policy to, to substantiate and to enforce these premises that we've all agreed to, right? We, of course, we all want equality. Of course, we all want this or that. that. Of course, we all want to dismantle racism. And then as people find out, like, wait a second, that's not, what did you mean by that? Wait, you want to do what? you really want to defund the police? Like, but you've already bought into the premise. So now you have set yourself up to where to disagree and you've, and you've supported, you said, no, this is, this is the moral thing. These are the good guys. What we're trying to do is a good thing. You built the Mott, you built the Mott. And then once you realize that it might not be what you thought it was, well, now you've created a, a situation where you now have to attack something that you yourself have presented as moral that you yourself have given legitimacy to. And it's a very difficult thing to do. And, and it, and it kind of disseminates from there is the people that trust you are saying, yeah, I guess so. And so on and so forth. And it, and it spreads. And then as people wake up to it, they're in a position to either be cast as immoral, as oppressive, as uh, someone who is, you know, creating rape culture or a racist society, or, you know, the, colonial, this thing, whatever, um, that's what you're going to be cast as. And, you, and you've probably also participated yourself. I'll think about cancel culture here. You yourself have also probably participated in canceling people for opposing this stuff. So you know what happens if you, if you oppose it. You know, that's why they used to have public hangings and public lashings and the stocks were in public. So people would see what happens to those who oppose the authority here and they set an example, you know, and they get people to, you know, throw the rotten fruit at the people in the stocks so that you, you've participated into it, you bought into it. And so you know, what's going to happen if you uh, ever do the same kinds of things that landed those people there. 
Um, and so then once the, the policy is in place to enforce it, it, it's, it's there and it's very, very difficult to turn it around because it's got its tendrils in and it continues to infect from there because legitimacy breeds legitimacy. So that's how you get, you know, it, it gains legitimacy in education and it gains legitimacy in news media, it gains legitimacy in corporations and so on and so forth. Um, as it promulgates in these areas, uh, does that make sense? And that cancel yeah. culture is part of it, um, is that people have bought into the premise and it's very difficult for them to reject it once they realize they bought into something different or they just exist with dissonance and continue to build that mot um, by saying, no, what they really mean is this. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think, I think cancel culture is a great example. Sorry, yeah. I, I think you, well, I think you actually illuminated a really good point of the, the public shaming aspect of it. You know, we, we always think, uh, and like I said, the pushback against cancel culture of us on the right saying the left is partaking in it is the left or people on the right who don't like uh, the state of the right right now saying, you know, we've participated in it too. And you boycott something, that's cancel culture. Well, it's a bit different between boycotting something and a public proclamation of someone's evil doing, right? This is the, the public square uh, proclaiming, because I don't think anyone would cancel uh, something like Amazon. I mean, no one would cancel any of these celebrities if they didn't have a public outlet to show their virtue in canceling them. It just it wouldn't happen because no one would care enough. And it's that that public square that uh, allows you to proclaim your uh, dissent and your your uh, virtue for canceling someone who's so evil that uh, really uh, incentivizes this behavior and moves it forward. So I don't, I don't like the idea of completely marking this up to uh, the evils of social media. I think social media is a tool and it's just uh, amplifying the, the corrupt nature in our culture today. Um, but you know, it's certainly uh, done its job by amplifying the corrupt culture we have today. And it's, it's a public square to show your virtue uh, to cancel people rather than just doing a, a silent boycott where it's like, okay, I see a place. I'm just not going to go there anymore. No, I have to go to Twitter and tell people I'm not going there anymore. I have to tell people why they're evil. And I have to tell people why they should join me in boycotting them because it's the virtuous thing to do. There's a, I'm trying to find the, you talked about the public shaming uh, thing. There is a, a, an article. I've referenced this article so many times. And um, that was in Huffington post about feminism um, and the rise of, of celebrity feminism, and it's and it's got a, it's about like Huff or uh, uh, Taylor Swift and a bunch of others. So it was, it was in 2010. Celebrity feminism got trendy, and then women got angry. And there it talks about the election. Um, and let me find there is a quote here. Okay, the political, uh, okay, as we look toward the decade's close, the political and cultural climate has shifted dramatically. Feminism is both mainstream and expansive and essential. An explicitly political uh, project in a world in which virulent online misogyny has become uh, de rigueur, R-I-G-E-U-R, I -E -U -R, I don't know. Uh, Sounds like a familiar word. Yeah, uh, anyway. And in which celebrities and others who choose to publicly claim the feminist label are being asked to do the work of feminism rather than pay it lip service. I think into the decade, there was this rising popularity of feminism that started as a slow burn and then increased towards the middle of the decade. So there's this girl writing, so I think she was a writer for girls. And it says, uh, uh, did, where is it? About the way they were, uh, they get, sh okay, here we go. There's a growing, nobly uh, intentioned movement to make feminism more act accessible and inclusive and to combat the decades of misinformation and negative stereotypes that surrounded the movement. And it talks about how it worked for Beyonce, how it worked for, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, Kaylee Kuko, who was her name from uh, Big Bang Theory? Oh, yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I know who you're talking about, but I have no idea what her name is. Uh yeah, and how they um, they basically they got harassed online. Okay, yeah. So feminism is ultimately about equality for people's uh, of gender identities, but perhaps more importantly, it's about defining what that vision of equality will look like and what pathways are required to get there. It's about legislation in the courts and elections and knocking on doors and protesting in the streets and joining a union and protecting the most vulnerable among us, even if you're not a member of that group. And so. Uh, this is where they get to the the online thing. 
Um, what year was this published? This article, article? was from from this year, I, I, oh, I really? believe. And so, yeah, this is where they say, okay, here it is. So they say there's all these celebrities paying lip service to feminism, but actually what it really means is legislation and all this action that we've got to tell you to do. It's not just about equality between the sexes, but all these other things. And then here's the quote. You can't get away with a stupid, pithy definition of feminism and expect to get a cookie anymore. You have to be able to speak about it in a more educated, thoughtful, and action-based way, or everyone is going to come for you. This feedback loop can be used to shame celebrities into more responsible engagement with political issues and can also be a means of education itself. So that's what, I mean, what you're saying, people wouldn't cancel celebrities if there wasn't a public way to do it. But the, but this works as a way of shaming. I mean, they literally say shaming is a tactic to say, if you don't subscribe to our definition of feminism or our definition of inclusivity or our definition of equality, then we're going to come after you. If you just try to use these old definitions, it has to be redefined to mean what we want it to mean. And there's going to be the people in the stocks. There's going to be the public shaming of if you don't get on board with this. And that's what cancel culture really is, is it's not just saying it's not a boycott is I'm not going to engage with your product. Cancel culture is I'm going to crap all over your product. I'm going to shame you and make and I'm going to make this a moral thing like where you are evil and I'm going to completely destroy your character publicly until you are, you know, either you weather the storm, all a Terry Crews, I would put him in that category, at least thus far, uh, or until you cave. And, you know, it, it's kind of a coin flip on what, which one of those you're going to do. But more often than not, it, it comes up tails for people and they, and they cave, they cave to it because this is the tactic of this group that says, no, you might think feminism is about equality between the sexes, but actually it's about all these things that have nothing to do with gender, that same principle applies to race, to sexual identity, to gender identity, to um, economic groups, to all of these others, to climate, you know, that we're going to redefine it. And if you don't, if you don't get on board with what our vision is of this thing, well, then we're going to come after you. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's, the culture is in the name of cancel culture for a reason. And uh, it, it shows you the power of culture. Um, that's extremely important for, for our understanding of um, its effects compared to, to public policy. I mean, one of the things that irked me so much, and it, and it has to do with a theme that Breitbart, you know, came up with uh, politics is downstream from culture. You know, when I'm reading a book like, like Abram Kennedy's how to be an anti-racist, he, the, the last chapter that I did a review on, he, tr he attempts to disassociate and he, he openly says this, that culture has no influence on behavior, yep. which is like the, the base, like, obviously that's not true. Like any, like you don't even have to have a basic education to understand like, Oh, that's, that's wrong. But it's his attempt to disassociate the link between culture and race that people can jump to saying race has an influence on behavior, which is not uh, explicitly true. But again, there's a link between culture and race that has to do what I argue is tribalism. It's the reason you see a lot of races subscribe to a certain culture is because they say, hey, a bunch of people who look like me subscribe to the same thing. Maybe I should. And then that culture has a very, very strong influence on your behavior because what culture does, it builds an understanding of how uh, or it helps you, one, build traditions, which is normally like religion. And to say if religion doesn't have a major role in influencing your behavior, you're insane. Uh, and also it's just, it's the way you view yourself. And, and he says this, the way you view yourself has an influence on your behavior. And, and to me, it's like you're still trying to disassociate culture. And I know it's you're trying to get rid of the link between race and, and behavior, which is, I think, a good thing in, in the grand scheme of things. But he's doing it in a very dishonest way. Where, uh, you know, he, he talks repeatedly about the stories of him and his interactions when he's younger. And, you know, he didn't care about performing well in grade school because that wasn't his idea of how a, a black kid should act. And it's like, well, yeah, it, it's the, the narrative you're telling yourself completely affects your behavior. And that is part of culture. You cannot just disassociate the two and act like your behavior is not going to change depending on your different belief system or the narrative, again, the narrative you tell yourself you're living in the way you see yourself and the way you see yourself interacting with other people. 
And I make this point because it's cancel culture with the intention uh, on changing behavior permanently to bend the will against whatever virtue is trying to pass along that cancel culture. And they, they intimately understand this yet also try to make rejection of this relationship at the same time. So it's a, it's an interesting dynamic at play when people utilize cancel culture or you have people like Dave, uh, was it uh, David blow, David blow, um, Charles blow, Charles blow, whatever he blows the, the most yes. apt name I've ever heard. And, and uh, maybe we should do a different podcast where we just go over that Oprah interview thing where he is. I just, think we need to, it's he, he, he's the worst uh, out of everyone in there. Um, but he, he flat out says there's no such thing as cancel culture. And he's like, uh, dude, you're, you partake in it every day. You work for the New York Times, who is one of the best, most efficient forwarders of cancel culture there is out there. Yep. And it's either you intentionally have blinders on um, or you're an idiot, which is not like Charles Blow is obviously an intelligent person. I don't think he's an idiot. It's the, the intellectual dishonesty and bad faith attacks that uh, are driving this movement. It's uh, Anna Kasparian. I've heard her make the same argument from over at Young Turks uh, that there's no such thing. It's just people voicing their opinions. And it's like, OK, but that'd be it'd be different if it if there wasn't that component. Like. Uh, are people afraid to voice their opinion because of the way that you're voicing your opinion? If so, that's cancel culture. Um, but well, it's interesting that, you know, I, what they talk about in that. Oprah video you referenced is get out there and vote. This is all about voting and action. It's same in that Huffington Post article. It's about voting and legislation and all this other stuff um, and getting out there and making your voice heard, but only if you agree with us. You know, it's okay, vote for who? Vote for who? Um, whenever you're talking about culture, uh, this is something that is so pervasive. I ran into it in um, the idea that culture and, and outcomes and behaviors are totally disconnected. So whenever I was, I was researching a video that I did just the other day and I was researching about the way cultures develop, like subcultures, organizational cultures, so cultures in nonprofits and businesses, you know, all these other things, like, you know, not from any type of racial component, but anytime people group together based on interests or shared values, a culture is created out of that. Um, and there was a video that I watched and where uh, these guys, it was, um, what was the name of the channel? Um, a partial perspective and they had said in their video that cu cultures are, are created or of uh, people trying to say that cultures have different or hierarchies of cultures is all based in bias that only bias is what creates hierarchies between cultures and I commented and I asked them if they would expand on that idea and also if all biases are a bad thing um, in other words if I'm biased towards a culture that um, allows women to wear what they want as opposed to a culture that says you have to cover your face, is that a bad bias for me to have? Um, and one thing they said that was really interesting is, um, and, and I, I'm going to read this little section here and, and their response, uh, because it's exactly what we're talking about, just how pervasive and how I, this type of statement, the way it so casually exists, is really astounding to me. Um, what they say is that the cultural differences are their learned habits, patterns, and overall feelings. And while the society, while society is the social structure, institutions, et cetera, culturally speaking, there's no real data showing that any cultural trait brings about more success by any metric. And they, and that, that was just one part of their, but so they said that the habits and behaviors doesn't bring about it. And, and my question, they, they gave a very thoughtful, I'm not trying to straw man them. They gave a very thoughtful answer. Um, and I said, you know, I, I appreciate that. Um, would you, here's what I said. I said, would it be correct to synthesize these two statements you give in the first answer into, into the following, there is no real data showing that a group of people's habits, patterns, or feelings contribute to the group's success or lack thereof as measured using any meaningful metrics. And I said, if that's, if you, if you, if that's what you mean, please explain that because how could you not say that their habits, patterns, and feelings or behaviors have no relationship with their success or lack thereof? That's insane. And their response was, uh, thanks for giving that statement. It's helpful um, now that I see it synthesized. And now that you say that, I don't necessarily 
agree, but it's also not necessarily incorrect. And so they're saying it's it's still not an answer. Like they're saying, you know, I don't know if I agree. I should be but a politician. In, yeah, seriously, it's not incorrect to say that a, that the be- beliefs, behaviors, and patterns of a group has no relationship with it with its success. Um, but but I was just astounded that even on the smallest level, in you know, in some random YouTube channel where they made this, they still had that view. And even whenever I rearticulated it back, like, so this is what you're saying. Here's two sentences. Let's put them together. You know, I'm not trying to do the Kathy Newman thing. So what you're saying is, but please tell me if this is not what you're saying, that they still did, didn't see any issue with that. And, and that's, a, that's a really crazy idea because you've now just completely detached the actions of a person or group from the outcomes of their life. And once you do that, you, you now create space for different explanations for those outcomes. And that's where you can get to this, you know, that, that any equal, inequalities are because of oppression or bigotry or prejudices or racism or misogyny or whatever. Um, because you've now delegitimized the notion that is intuitive to anyone with half a brain cell that your actions do bear some relationship with the outcomes of your life. Um, you know, for example, if I choose to not eat for the rest of my life, the rest of my life will be a very short time period because I have chosen to not act to give myself sustenance. Um, you know, so, uh, but, so we all know this, but it, they've, like you said, they kind of do both ways where they'll say we do know it, but we don't actually know it. It does exist, but it doesn't exist. Um, so in other words, it's selective application of these principles and ideas, but that's what makes it a perverse ideology. Back to what we're talking about here is the way that it changes definitions, the way that it manipulates and uh, infiltrates any thought structure or any uh, value structure to make it conform to their desires, to make it conform to their values and problematize, you know, as we would say, problematize everything. Um, that's that's what makes it perverse uh, because it's not actually authentic in what it does, and it and it preys on people's good intentions um, to create this perverse worldview. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it, the way it's branded, and this is the genius inside of of the ideology. It's not a bunch of idiots at the helm of this thing <laughs> driving it for sinister intentions. It normally takes a, a pretty well-developed um, understanding of human behavior yet at the same time, a complete rejection of human behavior to, to understand how to uh, functionally send this out to the world and have a majority of people believe in it. Right. So a lot of it, again, is the branding, the black, black lives matter who who disagrees with that statement no one of any sort of moral character disagrees with that statement but when you make blm inc and you can kind of float between the meaning of the statement and the stated objectives of the organization and you conveniently use this double think term from Orwell's 1984, where it's like there's two different definitions, the same term or same word, and I'm going to use whichever whichever one fits my narrative at any particular time. That way, I can completely manipulate the way people interact uh, with my ideas. Like I, I can make a moral claim if you disagree with them, and if you agree with them, I can now. Uh, scope drift outside of my original meaning there and start to encompass all these other things that have nothing the Bailey. to do with the statement. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yep. it's, it's a genius tactic. I mean, it's a, you have to have a, a well, well-rounded understanding of human behavior in order to, to use these type of tap, uh, tactics and implement what they do. So that, that tells us that they understand uh, the the limitations and the abilities of human behavior and how how it works in our psychology. Yet the w- what they try to teach us, what they purvey, is kind of the opposite of that. Yep. You know, it's like, well, you're unconstrained. Don't be constrained by this. But I'm going to use the tactics that I know fit inside this constrained vision totally. that are going to make you adhere to my ideology. Yeah. So um, to kind of bring it home a little bit, I think that. And I and like I said I, you know, earlier, I think that we kind of open the door to explore some specific areas of corruption, whether it's the news media, whether it's uh, higher ed, um, or corporations generally, and what's taking place. 
um, or, or not just higher ed, but public education now at this point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that, you know, it'd be probably good to end on a note where we give people some practical, like, what do you do with this kind of thing? Um, and the picture I have in my mind is, you know, there's so many different movies where, you know, there is this door slowly closing, right? And that, you know, they kind of get the ship through there. Indiana Jones makes it just underneath, you know, rolls under just in time um, before the they're sealed in the tomb forever, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and if we're serious about the way in which this thing is sealing itself off from feedback, uh, the way in which this thing is actually gaining institutional power, um, which, which we are serious about that, and we do mean that, um, then I see it as our window of opportunity before, cause, you know, I'm not trying to be alarmist, man. I, I don't, I hate that, but I do see a real way in which, you know, let's say if things progress, okay, the, the room we have to provide input into this to course correct right now, the window and the ability is smaller than it was two years ago. And two years ago, it was smaller than it was probably four years ago or four years before that. And so I think that it's probably reasonable to say that our, as this gains institutional power and as it gains, you know, it, it's an you know, incestuous uh, way that it gains legitimacy because it just gains it from itself, but that's a whole nother thing. Um, but as that happens, you know, I, again, I think our window is closing a little bit in terms of how we can course correct here. And that's what we talked about in, in part one of that last one of this matters because this has a trajectory. This has a conclusion. It goes somewhere. It has impact on our lives in a way that's, that's worrying. Um, it's, it's super worrying. And so as a way of kind of giving people a, you know, okay, we're not, not trying to be apocalyptic here, but, you know, the ability for us to try and, you know, steer the ship back towards a place of sanity and not just of that, but where our freedoms are, you know, are less at risk than they are now because our, we have a lot of freedoms that are very much at risk right now. Um, then there's a sense of urgency there. And if there's a sense of urgency, then, you know, we probably have to at least convey that and give some practical, you know, thoughts on, okay, so what do you do? What do you do with this, with this information? Um, what do you, how do we, if we do believe that, you know, and you can tell me if you disagree that maybe, maybe we're not, maybe the door isn't closing and maybe we're fine and we'll have all the same opportunity a year from now as we have right now. Um, within the gut, without changing the rules ourselves and without trying to, to do the same thing, what do you see as some practical ways in which, so if people do buy into this and if if they're even still with us at at this point in the conversation, but you know, where we can say, here are some ways in which, you know, you can try to push back against this thing, you know, and to, to hijack Kendi a little bit, it's not good enough to be uh, anti, or it's not, it's not good enough to be not an authoritarian Marxist uh, freedom crusher, you know, critical theorist. You have to be anti-authoritarian Marxist uh, critical theorist freedom crusher. So what are some ways in which uh, you would m- maybe give some people just some maybe practical, uh, simple ways to either maybe first identify it and then if they can't already, and um, then to give some pushback, provide some some resistance to it. Yeah. Um, so what I think, and the, the distinction that you made that I think is super important uh, when starting this conversation is we always think of these um, uh, corrupt ideologies making their way into higher education while well, they're making their way into general education. And, and the problem is if we change it, if we teach these to kids that are are beginning to understand how to, how the world works, this, this will become kind of, we talked about before how uh, freedom is not the default position like that. That is something that we were taught into. And, and part of that is teaching that into kids when they're younger. Uh, now, like you and I grew up to have a heightened sense against inequality, right? If we see someone being treated 
differently because of the color of their skin. That's a heightened sense to us to say, hey, no, that's wrong. Stop doing it. We want equality. That, that is what we want. If this 1619 Project type uh, anti-racist curriculum gets into basic education, the default position will move from equality to equity. And that will teach kids that the default position is to equalize outcomes and the, the resources you have to use in order to equalize that outcome naturally uh, takes away rights, will take away individual liberty. And, you know, as you say, the, the window's closing. Well, every single time that we get a step closer to teaching this type of stuff to younger and younger children as they're starting to develop and, and see the world for the first time, uh, the window will be closed once, once that happens. Uh, and we can't just rely on private education to just push back against it because that's getting attacked as well uh, very vigorously. So, um, you know, we, we see the problem there, but ways you can fight back against it is things as simple as, uh, there, there should be uh, school board meetings that go through the curriculum at your school, at your kid's school and attend that stuff. And, and the hardest thing and a really good thing that, uh, uh, Carolyn, I forgot her last name. She's got her own locals community. Um, Carlin Bersinko. Yeah, Carlin Basinko. And uh, something that she pushed back on, and something that I love that she said is, I get all these, uh, you know, right wingers who say, oh, man, I, I'm so glad you're speaking up. I wish I could do the same, but, you know, I would get canceled or fired for doing it. And she's like, dude, stop being a wuss and just do it. The problem is you. The problem is you are not speaking up. And if you're going to live your life scared of not voicing your opinion just because it descends from, the popular narrative at the time, well, guess what? Nothing's going to change. And, and that's part of this. Go, go to the board meeting or, you know, the school meetings that kind of go over the curriculum and voice your opinion and say, I don't want my kid learning this stuff that, you know, there, there is no good reason to learn, to learn it this way or, or to forward this kind of narrative. You have to, to push back. And normally if you do it in a respectful way, a lot of people will be receptive uh, of what you have to say. I know someplace like where, where I'm at and in, in a very, very progressive town, uh, it's going to be harder to push back. I'm sure I'm going to get labeled as some insidious names, but that, that is the sacrifice I make for my children. You know, I, I sacrifice a lot of what I do to make sure that they grow up to be uh, productive members of society. So that's one way to, to push back against education and then just more generally voicing your opinion uh, in appropriate places, right? If the workplace is not an appropriate place to normally discuss politics, but if politics is brought into the workplace by HR, you got to push back on it and you have to be willing uh, to do it in a respectful way. Again, go in prepared, go in understanding the issues and, and do it in an intelligent way. Uh, because if you're going to just go off the cuff and, and uh, you know, start to bloviate on just uh, kind of the mega uh, politics, uh, you might get some pushback and you might get fired just because you sound like you're just kind of going full in in this ideology that's labeled as racist by the mainstream media. So you got to do it intelligently, but that does not mean you can't do it at all. And, and this is kind of a, a thing that I've shifted in my head because Ben Shapiro used to talk about this is like, if you're in school, should I speak up against my professor or should I just take the, the good grades and act like a good, you know, little uh, progressive uh, Marxist just to get the good grades and then disprove them. You know, once I get the free market, then I can, you know, um, disprove their theories by actually acting in the free market. And, and you know, everyone else uh, on uh, Ben Shapiro's Daily Wire <laughs> except the exact opposite is like, no, you can't, you can't keep doing this. And I used to be on the Ben Shapiro side of this. And now I'm on the other side of it where it's like, and even he, I think is starting to change uh, his ideas on it. It's like, you, you have to be able to speak up. You got to be able to do it in a respectful manner. Like, do your homework. That's the big thing. You need to be intellectually curious about some of this stuff in order to really learn uh, what position that you want to advocate for. But you have to be able to push back and you cannot be scared of getting canceled or getting fired to do so because that that culture of being scared, which is truly what we, we've seen uh, leading up to Trump, and I think a good thing that Trump has brought uh, to the right wing side is, is starting to say, Hey, you, you have to push back. Sometimes uh, you're going to get in a fist fight. You got to be able to fight back. You don't just sit there and hide behind something. And you, you have to be able to, to throw your own haymakers and be able to uh, push back against some of this 
uh, awful corrupt uh, culture or it's going to take over everything. You know, it's already taken over most institutions, but it has not taken over the overarching American culture that believes in freedom because we think that's the default position for us in the American experiment. And once that changes, once the default position changes, you've lost the American experiment. It's going to be over. Yep. Yeah. Well said. <clears throat> I, uh, yeah, I agree with you. Like whenever you, you talked about, you know, objecting when it's appropriate, the first word I'd written down, I was just writing some notes, uh, was discernment. Um, and you know, having the idea that yes, you want to give pushback, but you also need discernment of, you know, how to pick your battles. Um, and the ways in which to do it. And I think something that's so, so important is that, you know, I agree with Carlin that whenever, you know, she says, you know, no, speak up, don't just say, you know, I can't do that. Um, but I also think that, you know, you don't want to dismiss the, the claims that people were like, okay, but I have three kids. Um, is this worth me losing my job? Like we lose our insurance, we lose our house. If I lose my job, you know, um, so, what's anyone's everyone's self-interested. So, you know, I don't, I'm not, um, I'm not sent, you know, unsensitive to, uh, to that perspective at the, at the same time, what's baked into that assumption is that, uh, this will go away or I can continue to like my life as I understand it can persist in this static state. And that if I leave this thing alone, it'll leave me alone. Um, or it won't, or the ways in which it inconveniences my life won't increase. Um, and so, and I think that's what people have to understand is that um, this is only going to grow and further metastasize and further seek to constrain liberties. And, you know, for some reason, every time we talk about this, I've, I, I look at everything, not everything, a lot of things through movie lines and movie lenses. and, and there's this line in Avatar that I think has popped into my head maybe like 10 times in different conversations we've had um, that I always think of about whenever um, people maybe realize too late what's going on. Um, and that is, you know, you think about whenever the, the dude that had the scar on his face, the, the kind of the, the bad military guy, um, you know, whenever Jake he gets back to their base or whatever. One of the scientists tells him, you know, he's, he's rolling, he's rolling for war and there's no stopping him. And at that point in time, he had seized control of the mining operation and had fully mobilized all of its resources towards just going and destroying the, the Navi. Like he had seized control. It was done. Um, and so there wasn't any, there, there wasn't any opposite opposing him subtly it had to be in this giant conflict at the end of the movie. And so I think about that line for some reason that, you know, this thing will reach a tipping point where it's on the war path and people are going to go, there's no stopping it. Like we're, we're here. It's, it's fully mobilized all the different thing. You know, Hydra is ready to go. It's ready to go bomb all the cities. Um, and I, and I don't think people realize that that is, on our current trajectory, and again, I'm open to being wrong here. Uh, this is something I've really marinated in for the last several years. Is you know, on our current trajectory, I don't see another outcome. You know, either this thing fully succeeds in its goals of taking over the institutions and remaking it with its ideology and uh, remaking our society, dismantling and then rebuilding our society according to their vision, uh, or it doesn't. And it's only been gaining momentum. It's only been gaining power. It's only been gaining legitimacy. And so to those people who, you know, have that concern, fair enough, fair enough. But understand that this is not going anywhere. This is not, you know, it's, it, it's not going to just walk on by you. It's not like a velociraptor or a T-Rex. If you freeze, it'll just walk past. It's the velociraptor. It sees you. It might not attack you right now. Um, but it, but it will still get you eventually. And again, I'm not trying to be alarmist. It's just, we see this, we see this everywhere. We see this in all the ways that it's happened. We see it in people being forced out of their jobs, people being fired in, in education system, people losing custody of their kids, 
um, with the, if they disagree with certain things. So, I mean, this is already happening. It's not like we're not projecting some apocalyptic, you know, vision of the future. We're just saying this is what is happening and it will continue to happen more and more um, in how this thing operates. But to, to your point about pushing back and doing it in a way that's appropriate, you know, yeah, have discernment and, and pick your battles. I think that, like you said, if you just come in and you try to make it a MAGA thing or try, you know, I don't care. You know, one thing, you know, I, and I mentioned this in the last video that I made about when, it, you know, how I draw the kind of parallels between this thing and emotional abuse is that, you know, I think that we have to be aware that so many people that are forwarding this are accomplices and they don't realize it, that they are, that they don't know what they're doing. And the last thing we want to do is validate the ideology that they've bought into as being this morally superior ideology. And so I think that we do have to pick our battles and have discernment and also try to have grace with people um, be firm, but be very firm about this is what you're saying. This is what you're doing and, um, try to steal that moral. I think so much of this has to do with the perceived moral high ground of this. No one wants to be called a racist. No one wants to be called a sexist. No one wants to be called a bigot. Like no one wants to, you know, be part, part of any of those things. What's fascinating. I thought I had earlier is, you know, in our society, like whenever you said, um, you know, the worst thing you could be called as a racist Nazi, you know, really, I would, I would say racist, you know, I, I really think that that has, if you were to take those two words and it, what someone believed you were, because we've watered down the term Nazi so much and we've amplified the term racist so much, I would say it's actually probably be worse to be called a, a racist than a Nazi now. And what's fascinating is that in our country, that is the thing that understandably that people are most afraid of being called because it, it is the most detested perspective. Yet for some reason, at the same time, we supposedly live in a country that is built on racism, yet it's the thing that everyone is most terrified of being associated with. Again, for a good reason, because racism is evil. It's evil. It's, it's destructive. It, there's, it's perverse. And so if we live in, supposedly we live in this very racist society, but also racism is the thing people are most terrified of. But, you know, again, it doesn't have to make sense. But my point is, is that People have to pick their battles and not be afraid of, of the name calling that is comes from this supposed moral high ground. You know, it, they're going to say that they're, they're going to gaslight. They're going to flee up into the mott and say, oh, yeah, you just so you don't you don't care about police brutality. You don't care about black lives or you don't care about um, the, the, the wage gap. You don't care about, you know, feminist issues or whatever. Um, but what you do is say, yes, I absolutely care about those issues. Here's all the ways that I care about it. And here's all the ways in which you're opposed to it. But you have to pick your battles in that way and have that discernment. Like you said, only do it in a way that's appropriate and don't get caught off in the weeds because they have a lot of, a lot of layers that they kind of keep this proletariat uh, bourgeoisie ideology under and they're okay peeling back those layers because it all is a straight line. The minute you get caught up on MAGA or kids in cages or something like that, or, you know, we have systemic racism or something like that, you're, you're, you're now over here and you're not actually addressing the, the real issues with their ideology. So you have to stay focused. You have to, like you said, be educated and you can't be so naive to think that you can just sit this one out basically. Um, and I understand that the, uh, to kind of preemptively address, you know, so earlier I referenced Don Lemon, you know, silence is not an option kind of thing here. And I think it would be a, a, a reasonable claim for someone to say, okay, so you guys are spending all this time talking about these people who are forcing, you know, compelling action, compelling speech, saying people can't just be free. They have to side with us or else they're one of the bad guys and otherwise they're complicit in the system. And you're kind of making the same case. And my point is, is you can be silent if you want. I'm all, all I'm saying. And I think what we're saying is just understand the consequences of that. Just understand that um, if you do value liberty, if you do value your freedom, if you do value truth and, and, uh, and a nuanced understanding of history and real, real opportunity for people and real opportunity for human flourishing, then, then you do need to be aware of what, 
that that is currently um, in jeopardy. That's all. And so, yeah, we would encourage people to if and also we're not saying speak out with our only if you have our views. But if you do have these views, you should speak out whenever you disagree with what so, someone else says. So speak out if you disagree with us, but also speak out if you agree with us, because the, the problem is, is that only one group is speaking out. Um, so we're not saying other people need to silence themselves either. Um, but it's, it's that if you share these, these views, you got to give pushback uh, whenever people are trying to shove their views down your throat and you have to do it in a way that's discerning, um, but also not naive to where this thing leads. Uh, so I, I don't know, does that seem like a fair distinction to make of like, yeah, it's totally, it'd be a reasonable criticism. Um, I don't know, but does it seem like I yeah. addressed that? I had a, a kind of a tangent thought that I thought was funny when you said, uh, it's worse, I think, to call someone a racist than a Nazi. I think that's true in America, although I think it'd be different in Europe, right? Different sure, contexts. Sure. And that just made, that has made me think, I wonder if they use the term grammar Nazi in Germany or if that's just... <laughs> The term they probably avoid because of the uh, grammar racist. They say grammar yeah, racist. All right, yeah, grammar socialist or something. I don't know, but yeah. um, uh, yeah, no. I mean, I agree with everything you said. You have to, you know, everything like like we we've, we've been saying. There's no solutions. There are only trade offs. And mm -hmm. is the trade off worth it to you? If the trade off is not worth it to you, don't go complaining to other people saying, "I wish I could do this." Don't wish anything. Either you think the trade off is worth it, or you know, you can try to, to support uh, whatever political cause that you feel like you can't speak out on in, in some way, but, uh, you know, complaining about it and acting, I mean, really it's, you, you've seen a lot of people use the oppression narrative uh, to reverse itself to say, I'm oppressed because I'm a right winger, but can't say anything. It's like, well, you're oppressed because you choose to be oppressed in this particular case. It's like, you need to be yeah. able to, you need to, to weigh your options and speak up. And when it comes to people with kids, of course, there are externalities that are, uh, really, really bad. But again, that's kind of a, an order of operations thing for me. You know, if I'm, if I'm in a situation where I, I work at a progressive place and then my kids are also getting taught a progressive school, I'm going to push back at the school so they don't indoctrinate my kids before I push back on my work. You know, it's kind of the yep. order of operations that I feel is best to just make sure my kids, again, the, the danger here is the change in the default position from equality and liberty to equity or fighting against inequity that that would be the most dangerous thing and then another institution that i think we left out is is religious institutions you know mm. uh we we do see a lot of them kind of going woke if you're you're kind of in Absolutely. a christian tradition um and and that is something that you know i i would very very recommend i know it's super uncomfortable because the two things we feel most uncomfortable talking about in public is religion and politics and this combines both of them uh but another big thing is if the the religious institutions fall to this uh, bankrupt ideology game over uh, around the world, I would say that, that would be the worst case scenario uh, because we, we can normally look at these moral guideposts to help us uh, understand what we ought to do. And again, if we change our uh, moral system, moral foundation to uh, approve of these corrupt hierarchies and, and what we ought to do to help them uh, gain power, uh, that's, that's going to be the end of, end of us all i would say yeah. to not That's be true. too apocalyptic but we're all literally right. gonna die yeah well that is true um sh shameless plug i i made two videos about christians and legislation and christianity and the view of government trying to explicitly address some of these the ways in which this ideology um tries to infiltrate uh the christian worldview and biblical uh I get, yeah, biblical worldview and, and Bible verses. Uh, and one of the one on legislation, because that's what they do. They try to use um, this to, and I, and I also talked about the ways in which the right does it as well. It's just a little different. Um, but so I do have two videos on my channel specifically addressing that um, it, for that reason, because it is infiltrating in it. And I think that it has a, there is a special way in which it has, uh, inroads with religious communities, particularly Christian communities that uh, make people very susceptible to it uh, within those religious communities. Um, so I have That's the same, same thing as absolute liberalism. It's the same mechanism. The, the, yep. the, the not wanting to judge, which That's again right. is, a, exactly is right. a, 
is again not even the message in the Bible, <laughs> but yep. uh, you see when you have derivations of uh, Christianity that keep moving out and spreading out, uh, you're going to end up with a church that has a gay pride flag, you know, up front. Yep. And as much as I, I not against gay people, when I see that, I'm like, okay, you're you're now. It's not even the gay thing; it's the pride thing. The pride thing mm-hmm. is the one that that bothers me the most because the. Uh, I forgot called the queen of all sins or or something like that. Um, kind of an ironic name, but oh, pride. Uh, yeah. Yeah. To be pride, to be prideful is, uh, you know, is not something you should be. Um, I can't remember the word uh, for it. The basically opposite of pride. You should be humble, humble. There we go. You know, you know the thing. Yeah. yeah you know the thing. Yeah. And, and that's, um, you know, what's fun. You were talking about, I thought I had this thought earlier when you were talking about the, the not wanting to judge thing is I used to have this theory that basically tracked the way that we viewed sex in our, in our country and the way that that shaped the different social phenomenons we see now and how, you know, my thought was at one point in time, people realized that they like to have sex with, with lots of people and not just one. And that the way that they could get away with that is by saying, you don't, you don't judge me for me having sex, you know, outside of marriage or whatever. And I won't judge you. And it was kind of a contract. And it was an understanding that if I judge you for your sexuality and how you choose to express yourself sexually, then you do get to judge me and get to condemn me. And so that spread out to, you know, where people, you know, divorce became more common, you know, extramarital affairs, relationships, pornography, and all these other things. And then it eventually, then that became a natural, I mean, a natural uh, uh, next step of that is, is homosexuality where it's like, well, I've already said that you can't judge me. And so who am I to say that that's wrong? I don't want to judge you because then again, now I'm opening myself up to uh, that there being standards here. And so that provides an inroad there. And then the next step of course is trans and all these other things, because we've started from the premise I don't want anyone to condemn me. I want to be able to do what I want to do. And the only way I can do that is by having this agreement with people saying that I'm going to let them do what they want to do. And so I think, you know, I think there's obviously a lot more to it than that, but you can absolutely look, you know, in the roaring twenties really, you know, and there's some, there's, you know, there's a, what are they called? The Tijuana Bibles that, you know, the early iterations of that, that were later, uh, the soldiers had during World War One and World War Two, where you know, the little dirty pictures and stuff, and pornography, and and so on and so forth. That there's a kind of a through line through the sexual revolution that has that idea, but I think that is rooted in liberalism, you know, which is a good idea uh, at a base level of giving people the freedom to choose what they want to do with their life. Um, but I think where they go astray is by saying we can't also have values and say, yeah, you can do whatever you want, but here are the consequences of if you do this. And also you're going to be responsible for this, you know, give people the freedom to do what they want to do. But also if you go and have a bunch of kids with a bunch of different women or with, with a bunch of different or men, you know, then that's on you. Like that's not society's responsibility. Um, And there's, there's cost there. Those kids pay the price of the way in which their parents um, engaged in that freedom. And that's why values, you know, having a set of guiding principles and values is so important to having, uh, liberty. Um, so, okay. So I, I'm not sure that seems like an okay place to end it, but it also doesn't really feel like a great place to end it. Um, I mean, my, my thoughts are what I hope that we articulated here um, and I'll have to go back and watch this to see how I feel about it, if we actually articulated it well, or at least me, I think you've done really good here, um, is we're tr- we set, up the, set the stage for hierarchies, the function of hierarchies, how they work, um, the fact that the right and left had different roles in what they did with the hierarchy, the right typically maintained hierarchies, the left provided feedback when, at least in the American context, whenever... Uh, hierarchies became corrupted and started to serve the people at the top and was no longer doing what they're supposed to do. So one example would be, you know, government is supposed to, you know, provide, you know, secure the the freedoms of its citizens, protect the borders, um, and so on and so forth. Um, it starts to become corrupt when it's no longer interested in the 
the safety of its citizens and it's only to try to further its own power and ends. Um, and we kind of made the case that there's, there's uh, certain red flags that exist anytime a hierarchy becomes corrupted. Uh, you can see it, whether it's at a hospital, whether it's in the Jim Crow South, or whether it's in our um, current cultural milieu today. And some of those red flags are um, cutting off feedback from within the hierarchy to point out when it becomes corrupted, um, opposing feedback that it starts to serve its own ends whenever the hierarchy stops functioning as what it's supposed to do and starts to deviate to a different task um, that it uh, does. Uh, you pointed out, I think, astutely that when it changes the rules as it goes along to prevent that feedback and to basically legitimize the new goals that it's creating for itself um, at the top. Um, and the point that we've made is that there is a hierarchy shift, you know, that the left who had always provided traditionally provided feedback into the hierarchy has actually become the hierarchy of power. The counterculture became the culture probably somewhere in the nineties gained that legitimacy in the culture. And then within the left, there's been this other group that, you know, has a much more radical worldview, much more radical goals. And they've taken over the idea and power hierarchy within the left. And so now we have people, as you said, steering the ship, um, steering the bus that are um, not who we originally realized. So people have always kind of said, well, the left is kind of the dominant culture, but the people who are now the left at the top are different than what we uh, would have associated with maybe even 15 years ago. And they have goals that are fundamentally incompatible, not just with the rest of the left, but with everyone else in terms of how they want to remake society. And they'll use revisionist history. They'll use shame. They'll use cancel culture. They'll use shout downs. They'll use threats. They'll use disinformation. They'll use character attacks, all these things to further legitimize um, their goals and further legitimize their worldview that supports their goals. And a lot of the ways they do that is they, uh, they change the definitions of the language. They prey on the goodwill of people and say, yeah, I'm for equality. Okay. Well, this is what I actually mean by equality. Um, and so, and none of this is new. Hayek wrote about it in the forties. Um, they, the, the 1619 project is just another kind of, you know, take on Howard Zinn from the seventies. And some of this is new, but what's new is, the momentum that it has and how mainstream and how powerful it, it is. And so, you know, all of this seems like to me of, of this conversation we've been having is a way of trying to get people to understand where this came from, to understand what it is we're looking at, understand the trajectory of it, the, the goals, and understand, you know, kind of our responsibility if we find ourselves in disagreement with it. If you agree with it, then keep doing what you're doing. Um, and if you partly agree with it, then articulate that and also articulate the ways in which you disagree. And if you feel as we feel about the, the, the dangers here, then you need to probably find a way to oppose this um, because it's naive to think that you can just keep your head down and uh, that it won't, it won't come for you because it already is. Um, so that's kind of my, you know, as best I can vague summary of, what we talked about here, you know, again, I don't know, I don't know how well we did in articulating, you know, the kind of the dangers here and what we're looking at. Uh, but that's, that's my best. I don't know what, what your thoughts are here, kind of bringing it to a close. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think you articulated it, articulated it all perfectly. Um, you know, we need to learn from lessons of the past. We have to do it in a way we're going to avoid the, the revisionist history, right? You know, we want to look at what we did, uh, previously and, and learn from the mistakes we made or the right things we did. Don't go in there like we see in the 1619 project with an agenda and then select pieces of evidence that support your agenda and ignore the ones that don't. You know, we, we need to look back in there and, and look at kind of the roadmap we took when fighting against uh, Jim Crow and when, when fighting against even um, more uh, corporate ideas of, of a corrupt culture like the Rhode Island uh, hospital. Um, I mean, even in general uh, 
corporate culture is is a big thing. If you, you work at a somewhat large corporation, I worked at a large enough one that you do like leadership seminars and they openly say, this is the stuff you want to watch out for when you don't have any more feedback in the system. When uh, the people at the top uh, of the food chain at, at your work care more about their ego than actually their stated goals with uh, you know, their stated goals with the business. And if their stated goals in the, with the business is um, something you don't agree with, well, guess what's not going to happen? You're not going to be, you're not going to find meaning in that job and it's not going to succeed. Uh, or, I mean, it might succeed in their stated goals. But again, if you don't like their stated goals, go somewhere else. Uh, but most places stated goals is to, uh, you know, one, make a profit. A lot of times it's kind of look good with the community and and do all these other things. And if ego gets in the way, uh, from fulfilling those goals or cuts off uh, communication and feedback, then you know that it's it's going to not be a successful business. So we, we teach this to each other uh, in terms that we, we make not political and it makes sense. But once we make them political uh, now, uh, we're supposed to believe the exact opposite or uh, the attempt, mm-hmm. I think, by the um, radical people in, in that hierarchy is now they're trying to politicize everything. So now we can't even point to these leadership things. Now leadership can be racist. If leadership means you have more white managers and black managers, it's not proportional to the population. Now they try to try to say these things are racist because they have disproportionate outcomes. And that's that little change in definition in what racism is that completely flips this hierarchy upside down. And now has changed our goals without changing any of the verbiage in the goals. Just to change the definition of just one word. And that's enough uh, to completely flip everything upside down. And we need to watch yeah. out for that. Yeah. And you know, one thought I had that just to promise end it here um, is whenever you said we have to learn from the ways in which these things were dealt with in the past. Um, one of the thoughts that I had, you know, when I originally, I think I've articulated this in other videos, but one of the most earth shattering books, which I, uh, referenced here earlier was the road to serfdom. And I read it a couple of years ago and, um, I found a lot of the things that Hayek said to be really prescient. Uh, they were, they seemed almost prophetic for his time. And I'm like, this is what we're seeing right now. And so I started on this, this uh, kind of intellectual journey of trying to figure out what stopped the spread of those ideas of collectivist ideas at his time and to try and figure out if those mechanisms were in place now. Um, and I think that there was a lot of things that did that. I think the, you know, very broadly, the Nazis winning or losing World War II, uh, was was one of the things that quashed it, and I think the the fall of the Soviet Union is one. You know, the Gulag Archipelago, you know, kind of revealing the bankruptcy here, and the Cold War. In that, we found this enemy in Russia, and you know, we had the Red Scare, and the fact that you know, communist was a dirty word. You know, Russians were the main bad guys in every movie for you know like forty years. They still are the main bad guy in a lot of movies, um, and so basically, the toxification of that ideology, I think, is one of the things that did it uh, coupled with examples of its failure, uh, examples of its failure and people saying, we don't want to be like that. Um, and a news media that was willing to be honest about the, the failures of what was going on um, in these places that implemented these ideas. And, you know, I don't think we have the same things in place that were, you know, were sufficient uh, to stop the spread of these ideas and to s- stop the legitimate, Stop what legitimized these ideas in the past. You know, like the closest example of a place um, like the fall of the Soviet Union is Venezuela, but we don't, it's it's not covered as such. And, you know, whenever we talk about socialism, the, we're not given Venezuela, we're given Denmark, even though Denmark themselves say, stop saying that we're socialist. I mean, it was the, I think it was either the president of Denmark or Norway who said, Bernie Sanders got to stop saying that we're socialist. We're not. Um, Sweden. It was Sweden. Yeah, you're right. So uh, option C, but uh, but the but that's not that's not going to get covered. He's not going to get any pushback, you know, for saying that. And these ideas aren't toxified. Well, how do we know? Uh, well, what are the majority of Gen Z 
and millennials, are they more warm to socialism or are they more warm to capitalism? They're more warm to socialism because they're cut off from the way, you know, what happens, you know, whenever these things are put into place. People from all over the world in our country right now say, I'm worried about what's going on in the U.S. because this is what I fled. Um, this is what I fled. And they're, they're saying the same things that people said in my country 20, 30 years ago and that ruined our country. And so, you know, my point is this, is that, like, we do have to learn from these things and not just uh, the how, but, you know, what was there? What did it? And if those things don't exist now, you know, that's a problem. That leaves it to us. You know, we have to, we can't just assume that this is going to work itself out like it did historically because the same um, mechanisms, the same factors don't exist. It's much different than whenever, you know, communism, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall and or whenever we had the Red Scare and in McCarthyism, which, you know, there's obviously a lot of issues there in the, what the federal government did and handled the way it handled that. But the idea that communism is dangerous was a correct idea. Um, and a lot of people understood as a correct idea. That's why these groups were underground. Well, that's, that's not where we're at today. Um, we have people who are open Marxists that are serving in public office, uh, even though they have a political belief system that is, it's murderous um, when put into practice to the fullest extent. So um, yeah, I think people have to learn from that and also understand, I just, I just think we can't be naive about it. That's all. Um, that it's not the same as it was before. It's, it's a lot, it's a lot worse. It's a lot more pressing. Like you said, it's kind of, you look down and then it's, it's right up in your, it was in the distance. And then now it's right up in your face. Um, so yeah. Um, I don't know. We good to end it there. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think you, uh, you, you ended it beautifully. I have nothing to add. That was great. Okay. All right. Well, that was a long conversation. Um, I am interested to hear, hear how it turned out. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. This is the kind of thing you're interested in. Um, first off, please go check out Kevin's channel. Uh, that's at Engineering Politics uh, on YouTube. Engineering Politics, his locals community is thriving. He's got over 200 people over there having a conversation, um, posting stuff. It's really, really cool. So check his community out. It's uh, a or engineeringpolitics.locals.com and he's on Twitter, ENG underscore politics. Uh, he's on ThinkSpot. He's on, um, I'm going to remember it, Parler this time. He's on nice, Parler, nice. Uh, Twitter, all these things. So please follow him, check him out. And he's, I mean, he, like he showed earlier, he's got this book about the 1619 Project. He just got Howard's in. Um, Kevin's a prolific reader. He's doing a really interesting uh, chapter by chapter analysis of Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti Racist. So, I mean, I would highly recommend you're going to get a, a lot, a lot, a lot of really good and useful information and entertaining stuff over at his, um, at his locals community, particularly. So, I'd go check that out. Um, for my end, I have a locals community as well, return to reason.locals.com. Uh, also on Twitter at My Monday in Mind. You can follow me on YouTube. That's at return to reason. Uh, I'm also on ThinkSpot. I have articles posted on Medium. Um, oh, I forgot your website, Kevin. Uh, yeah, Kevin has an, a website as well. That's Engineering Politics. And I think he has a Facebook community uh, page as well mm. for Engineering Politics. Did I, did I miss? I'm sorry if I, if I miss anything else. No, no, man. You, you nailed it. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, please check that out. Uh, you know, I know we're going to be having more conversations. I always enjoy talking with Kevin about this stuff. And we didn't even get into any of the joe biden stuff or kind of the current you know we haven't talked about is this the natural is progressivism you know this ideology is it an aberration or is it the logical conclusion i mean you mm -hmm. said that it's something we agree that it probably is a logical conclusion but we haven't flushed that out. i think that's an interesting uh topic in and of itself um so there's we're going to be having more of these uh we appreciate you guys watching uh i think that's it kevin anything else no beautifully put man nice talk All right. Yeah, likewise. All right. Peace, guys. All right. There it is. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Make sure to join the Return to Reason Locals community and show Truman some support. You can go to returntoreason.locals.com to support his Locals community. And you can also find him on ThinkSpot and YouTube by searching Return to Reason. And you can also find him on Twitter at MyMundaneMind. 
And as I said at the beginning of the show, I want to take a quick moment to share different ways you can help support this content. There are a few easy ways to do this. You can follow me on Twitter at ENG underscore politics. You can give me a follow on Parler at Engineering Politics. You can join the Facebook group named Engineering Politics where I share and discuss content with the Facebook community. You can also subscribe to my video channel on YouTube under the channel name Engineering Politics where you can find the video version of each podcast. I'm also active on ThinkSpot, which is a discourse generating application that promotes intelligent and honest conversations while discouraging the trolling and nonsense found on most social media platforms. You can find all of my podcasts and videos on there as well. But the best way to interact with me, get the newest content, and support this podcast is the Engineering Politics Locals community. This is an amazing community that goes far beyond just a membership platform intermediary for creators. It allows followers of this content to get together and discuss the newest articles, podcasts, and videos all in one place. I strongly urge you to join the Engineering Politics Locals community at engineeringpolitics.locals.com. You can become a member for free. And now you can get a three-month free trial when becoming a subscriber if you use promo code EPFREE. That's spelled E-P-F-R-E-E, no spaces. I would love to have your support with your subscription so this content can remain independent and keep growing. Monthly subscriptions to the Engineering Politics Locals community start as low as $2 per month. So I hope I can count on your support so I can start making higher quality podcasts and subscriber content like the bonus content at the end of most shows. And the new video series, The EP Zone, available only in the Engineering Politics Locals community with a subscription pass. I appreciate your consideration. Let's build a community together. Thanks for listening. This is the Engineering Politics Podcast. None of the persons, podcasts, books, or other references other than engineering politics used in this work directly reflect my ideas and or personal beliefs, nor should they be held accountable for anything said during this podcast. Thank you for listening.